la, 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 la. I did a video a while back um, about writing techniques I really didn't like and it came up in the comments that I should do the opposite of that and make a video about writing techniques I really do like. So here we are. Now for the first one of these, I'm gonna like kind of do the inverse of one of the ones I really didn't like. So one of the ones I really didn't like was one line paragraphs. When something happens that the writer thinks is so important that that one sentence gets a whole paragraph just to itself. Um, you know, rarely, rarely does that work. Usually it's cheesy. I don't care how important you think it is. It's never gonna be that important that it gets a whole line to itself. Um, it's been, I've seen it done well um, in places and I've pointed that out uh, in the channel, but generally speaking, to be avoided. So I think the inverse of that is when something really dramatic does happen and the writer slides it right into the middle of a paragraph. You know, it doesn't even get the topic sentence. It's not at the beginning of the paragraph. It's not at the end of the paragraph. It's certainly not a paragraph unto itself. It's sandwiched in amongst all those other words right in the middle of the paragraph. I love it when that happens. Um, writers who I know who have done this are uh, Cormac McCarthy, Heinrich von Kleist, one of my favorite writers. Um, he has one story Story where at one point, I'm not going to say what story, but at one point the main character walks over to the window, pulls out a gun and shoots himself in, in the head and you know like then people run around and say oh my god and they you know they try to resuscitate him but he's very obviously dead and this the, 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 the killing, the, the suicide of the main character happens right in the middle of a paragraph as we're approaching the end of the story. So like that, to have that dramatic moment just like kind of stuck in there amongst all the other little things that are happening um, I don't know, somehow it, it makes it more shocking because it, it makes it just one event among many. It, it makes it mundane and we think these things shouldn't be mundane and that just, it makes it more shocking and wonderful, I think. Um, another one is Yukio Mishima. Uh, more recently I read The Temple of the Golden Pavilion and this one isn't a dramatic event but like um, just a very beautiful image. So I think it's like just striking, not necessarily events, but like striking things which are hidden inside the paragraph. I remember the image was of um, when when this guy is cutting uh, flowers for Ikebana, uh, for flower arrangement, that the shadow, the gigantic shadow of the head of the iris was being cast across the tatami floor. And that that image was like so, so beautiful um, and kind of like a little bit eerie and sensuous. And it was like, um, it didn't match a lot of the other kind of more functional words of the paragraph, but it was just there in the middle. So, you know, he, he didn't, he wasn't drawing attention to the image. You kind of had to like, you kind of have to find it hidden amongst the words. Whereas, you know, imagine if he had taken it out and put it at the beginning of the paragraph or given, heaven forbid, a whole paragraph on, onto that one image. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been so impressive in my opinion, because then, you know, like he's asking you, the writer sort of, look at this beautiful picture. Whereas if it's in the middle of the paragraph, you kind of have to find it yourself as a reader. Um, and I just, I really like that. Next up, we have character foreshadowing and more specifically when a character which has been foreshadowed makes their entrance into a novel. I absolutely love this. Um, sometimes, um, like one, one thing, one way of doing this is having the character's name be the the, the title of the novel. Like I remember in Anna Karenina, like, you know, it, I don't think it takes a really long time for her to appear, but she definitely doesn't appear at the beginning. And instead we follow her brother for a while. And it's like, just because we know that her name is the name of the book, we're like, okay, when she comes, it's going to be really important. And that gives you like this kind of excitement as you get through the first bit of the book. Um, Madame Bovary is the same, begins with her husband. And it's a while, I think, before we, we get introduced to Emma. Um, who else? Um, the Odyssey, again, the name Odysseus, the Odyssey, the character Odysseus is the one we, we know. I think in the first sentence it says like, this is about this guy called Odysseus, but then the action goes to his son and his wife who are waiting for him to return. And then the son like decides to go and find people on his own little adventure to see if he can get news of, of his father. And so like, there's all this like kind of, it's, it's a while I think before Odysseus actually um, comes into the poem. But in these examples, right? Like obviously we know that that character is gonna be in the book. And I think probably for me, the best examples of a character foreshadowing that like really impacted me is when I didn't even expect the character was gonna be in the book. So like in Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, um, I don't know why all these examples that I'm thinking of are like all big classics, but there you go. Um, but in Crime and Punishment, um, there's this character, Svidrigailov, or Svidrigailov, I'm not sure how to say it, but um, he's been talked about a bit. And I, I don't know if like 
why I was just so wrapped in the story, but he gets mentioned a few times by different characters, and we know he is connected. I forget, I forget now, but he's somehow connected to them, and he's kind of a sinister character. Um, and then at one bit, like quite late in the book, I think um, the main character wakes up, and at the foot of his bed on a chair is this guy, Svitra Kailov, <laughs> and it's like what you're you're here you're in the book and i remember like the character's shock is also like the reader's shock because at least it was my shock because i did not expect this guy was going to turn up and become like a really major character um so that was that was amazing also in a book i didn't like um the gathering um there's this brother called ernest who's a an ex-priest who lives in peru and he gets talked about um and when even though I didn't like the book. When he appears in the book, I remember I wasn't really expecting he was going to make an appearance. So when he appeared, I was like, oh, cool, this guy's in the book. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere, but it did. It, did, it was a thing that I liked. It did kind of make me think maybe something interesting was going to happen. So, yeah, even in books I don't like, that thing of an unexpected uh, character, or no, a character who you don't expect is going to appear, suddenly appearing, um, is, is something I really like. Third thing. Uh, repetition, especially repetition of a set phrase. Now this is something that I've seen done a lot recently and like it doesn't always hit the mark. Like in um, Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, there's this phrase, so it goes, which gets rep re repeated all the way through and it, it gets repeated specifically when someone dies or when something ceases to exist or like I think even like you know if something gets thrown in the trash or something sometimes he uses it in examples of things like you know like passing on or like kind of uh reaching their their end point um and it's done in a very like intentional and clever way and it structures the novel really and it kind of sometimes it's really surprising because you wouldn't expect something to be noted as a death necessarily like i said like something being thrown away or whatever and then so it goes appears and you're like oh um yeah <laughs> and the way that it gets repeated over and over again it becomes like kind of like a mantra um, and that also kind of creates this rhythm, which is really nice. Uh, and that's also in other books like um, At Night All Blood is Black. Um, there's these certain phrases like God's Truth and um, what was the other one? Uh, doesn't matter. Anyway, like there's these phrases that like get repeated, like just short little chunks that create like, you know, like a Lord's Prayer kind of thing, like you're like a, a monk chanting something, and it creates a really great atmosphere, I think. Um, in Slaughterhouse Five, though, I thought it was overused. I thought it could have been more effective if it was limited um, and I can see how this could be like also like really annoying for for some readers um, and it's probably hard to get right like when exactly do you do a repetition and when do you not um, I like especially the way um, writers do it when it it's so it's like a set phrase being repeated but it's so like inobtrusive that you actually you kind of question like hey have I heard that before like that kind of feeling I love. Um, Mieko Kanai does that um, in her stories, in some of her stories which are interlinked, where the, the kind of the main way that they're interlinked is these little repetitions of phrases and images, um, which when you read them, it's been so long since you read them before, you kind of think, wait a minute, have I heard this image before? It's like a deja vu feeling. Um, and sometimes maybe you're wrong, you know what I mean? It's because her images are very striking and you know that she does this trick of kind of like having something repeat in a different story and not so frequently. So it really creates this sort of uncertainty as well, um, which I, I love. Next up we have tangents. Tangents are one of my absolute favorite things in literature. Um, I, I, there's rarely a time when I read a tangent in a story which I don't like to be honest. Like I'm I'm really like, like when it comes to repetition I see so many ways you could get it wrong but with tangents I just, how can you go wrong with a tangent? With a good tangent of course you can go wrong with a tangent but I don't know. Um, I go on tangents myself quite a lot if you hadn't noticed so like maybe um, maybe I'm kind of biased here or projecting or whatever I don't know but like some of my favorite writers like um, Gogol Nikolai Gogol um, he has he's such a good tangent writer um, there's this in his one of his most famous short stories the overcoat there's this bit where um, the main character who I think is called a khaki or a khaki but he, he's being uh, bullied by his co-workers and um, the narrator mentions that one of the co-workers actually feels pretty bad about the bullying um, and then like after he quits the job and he goes and he meets this woman and, and like we get a whole paragraph about this co-worker just feeling like guilty dealing with his guilt and then settling down and having his life and blah 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 and then the paragraph finishes and it's like right back to Akaki and his story and it's like I don't know there's something about it where the, the story pulls you in one direction 
and then just like snaps back to where we were supposed to be and it's really like i find really like thrilling then there's ovid like ovid is the king of tangents um especially in metamorphoses like there's this one bit in the trojan war uh where there's a warrior on the on the trojan side who's called sickness i think and his um his his skin can't be harmed by any weapon he's like kind of like nothing can penetrate his skin um and the the warriors say you know has anyone ever seen anything like this before and nestor um who's the oldest on on the greek side says like i have seen something like this once before i i once saw another warrior like this called um kenius kenius senius i think it's kenius i think it's canus canus anyway let's say canus nestor says like I have seen this once before with a warrior um, called Canis and um, gather around and then he starts telling a story. So already we're kind of in tangent like area here when like it's the Trojan War. But, you know, at the camp, we're stopping to tell a story um, to try and make sense of something that happened in the Trojan War. And um, then he starts telling the story about this wedding um, and he describes the wedding in great detail and all the people who were invited and all the food that was on the table. Um, and like it goes on for so long that you kind of forget what the you know like what the point of this this whole thing was because it's so involving this wedding um and then the, a big fight between centaurs and humans breaks out at the wedding and one of the heroes on the human side appears and it's this guy Canis and when he appeared I was like oh yeah the story's about him and like I'd completely forgotten what the point of the story was and that like he was supposed to be the focus of the story um because the story had been so like kind of like I don't know just so well detailed and had been so like going off on its own path like so many things do in the metamorphoses that I I didn't even realize that like um and that that again is like the character thing as well like the character foreshadowing kind of thing kind of like a double whammy there so no wonder I liked it so much I guess I only realize that now huh that's also one of my favorite scenes for other reasons like there's this transphobic centaur because Canis used to be a woman and the centaur is like using all these female pronouns for him and like kind of like shouting at him about like oh you're you know you're just a woman and blah 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 and like we all know what you really are and so on and then Canis just like takes his spear and just kills the centaur <laughs> he just runs him through with it and it's really funny and yeah I love everything about that scene basically for this next one I don't know really what to call it it's foreshadowing but it's another type of foreshadowing um like I already had the character one right this one is like I don't know blatant foreshadowing um because I guess when we think of foreshadowing you know, like often it's, you know, there's a storm or something like that. And it's like, oh, a storm's coming. It's like, obviously the storm means something else is going to happen in the plot or with the character's emotions or something like that. You know what I mean? So often it's like kind of imagistic and it's got a metaphorical thing or someone says something which hints that something else might happen. But I mean something different. I mean, like when the narrative, um, whether it's through character speaking or the narrator, just directly tells you this is going to happen. Like um, in, in Carrie, I read Carrie not that long ago, and there's a bit where they say, um, you know, the only person who could tell us this is Carrie White's mother, and she, of course, is dead. Um, and that happens quite early on. Um, and then, you know, for the rest of the book, we're wondering, oh, how does she die? Also, like, I've seen a lot of people reading Dune recently because of um, the movie and stuff. And uh, yeah, like, a lot of people seem to really not get on well with that. There's a thing in Dune where they sort of tell you a lot of stuff that's gonna happen. There's a, someone who betrays um, the main characters and we go into his mind and we hear his thoughts saying like, I'm gonna betray them. Um, and like, I know a lot of people don't like that or have a kind of a bit of a problem with it because it feels then that like, there's no tension, right? There's no suspense because we just, we know exactly what he's planning to do and what his motivations are. Whereas if he didn't do that, you know, you might get like surprised, right? When it turns out he, he betrays them. But I don't know, like I'm totally fine with that. It didn't bother me at all in Dune. I had a lot of problems with Dune, but that definitely wasn't one of them. I quite liked that we we knew from the beginning what that motivation was. I thought it built tension and um, it allowed us like kind of a bit of characterization and stuff. And I didn't mind knowing what was going on uh, before before it happened, if that makes sense. So so yeah, things like that. Um, there was there's one book, uh, Demons, uh, which I read uh, last year, and this book was the maybe like. The book that pushed this kind of foreshadowing to its very very limits where even i 
didn't always appreciate it, but for the most part I loved it. It begins with this narrator telling us, um, that this, is, this, this book is a chronicle that I'm writing to explain like the terrible events that happened in our little town uh, in Russia. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Um, and he keeps, he keeps talking about like really mundane things, which seemingly have absolutely no bearing um, on any terrible events that are going to happen. And then, you know, he occasionally interjects and says like, well, I'm not very good at telling stories, um, but this is probably around the time that the events began, which really started things which were going to lead to the big terrible thing that happened. And this is a very uh, long book. I think it's like over 700 pages. Um, and honestly, it takes most of that book before any we start to get an understanding or an inkling of what the heck he's talking about. So yeah, this kind of foreshadowing, like I really liked it for the most part, but like after hundreds of pages of it, I was starting to be like, come on, just give me something, please, man. So, uh, so yeah, it, it can be overdone, I suppose. Next one is basically... Um, unreliable narrators but that just sounds a bit vanilla so I want to make it a little bit more like I guess more specifically um, narrators who are trying to convince you of something um, and like in a really like fun way um, like I like unreliable narrators where the reason they're unreliable is because they've got so much personality and you know they're just tell making these statements which you know without giving any evidence for them like for example moral judgments you know like this person is terrible she is the worst you know like you got to take my word for it you just she is absolutely the worst okay and then going on with the story without really explaining why um things like that where it's like they're really like not only they're unreliable but they're like yeah they're like energetically trying to you know um convince you of something that's that, i just really like that there's gogol uh he's got loads of narrators like this Aktagar Yunosuke, Karen Michaelis, she is, she's got this, her book, uh, The Dangerous Age. It's about this woman who goes off to live on an island and kind of like renounce society. And she's still living in like middle class comfort on the island. She's not like in a cave. She's got a nice house and she has two servants. Um, but she's like writing these really snooty and really bitchy letters to her friends, basically talking about how she's renounced love and she's renounced this and that. Um, and also like at the same time, we can see like she's, you know, kidding herself, right? Like her sense of like superiority for what she's doing is kind of like really like really funny and really sweet and really ridiculous. I like, I like ridiculous narrators. Maybe I should have said it like that. I like absolutely ridiculous narrators. Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is a good one. Um, you know, Telltale Heart, where the guy is like saying, I'm not crazy. Um, listen, I, I'm going to explain to you why I'm not crazy. Um, characters like that, again, like trying to convince you of something um, in a really like enthusiastic way um, is just really, uh, really fun to read, I think. This next one, I'm not sure what to call it. It's uh, like kind of like a bait and switch tactic where you start, you know, you start to understand the scene you think and um, based on prior knowledge of how these scenes usually go. For example, in Carrie, there's a bit where uh, there's a principal and he's waiting uh, like Carrie has been bullied right and she's uh and, and and one of the bullies has gotten in trouble and her father is a uh a, a big hotshot lawyer so like the hotshot lawyer is waiting outside and um like he kind of swoops in and he's got his briefcase and everything and the principal principal is waiting and he's like yeah send him in and he's got this paper clip and he keeps unfolding it um, and then putting it aside and then taking a new one and unfolding it and we don't know what that behavior means we know it's a habit of his but you know like it it doesn't the way the scene seems to go is that he is uh you know a timid man who is about to be destroyed by this hotshot lawyer um, who's like young and smooth talking and knows all these like kind of has all this legal jargon about why the school has to be sued for whatever for for him you know um, for punishing his daughter basically um, but then something happens and the, the principal actually has his own ace up his sleeve and knows some o has some of his own legal stuff that he's researched and bam it's like like I was completely caught off guard by the by the principal managing to to overcome the lawyer um in this scene and like things like that i mean you know where there's certain like archetypes where we kind of we feel we know which way something is going to go and then it like we, we we realize we've been misled um another one is the book i'm reading right now the mummy by anne rice um i'm reading this because like i i heard anne rice died last year and i would never read anything uh by her and i wanted to read something and um i don't know i was, I was just feeling like uh the mummy so I, I like mummies and um and yeah i thought why not and uh yeah like the, 
the the first chapter it's quite quite a long chapter but like i'm i'm gonna spoil the first chapter but it's the first chapter so you know but they go they find the mummy's tomb right um they go into the mummy's tomb and there's all this like oh the mummy looks like he looked at us and like he looks so alive and all this stuff about the mummy um and there's we we learn about the guy who's there and we learn about his family and the tension is building and something's going to happen we think um and then the danger does come but it's not from the mummy it's from the guy's asshole nephew the nephew comes in and he murders the guy he straight up murders the mummy researcher um in front of the mummy and i was like what so like you know nothing to do with the mummy right it was just like a family kind of thing he wanted him to sign some papers or whatever um so he could get money out of him and so now the story is proceeding and we've got the sort of the iconic um genre convention thing of the you know the newspapers printing the curse of the mummy kills the guy but we know it wasn't the mummy at all it was like this 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 asshole nephew right um and the mummy um contrary to the normal kind of mummy story uh was the witness right like he saw what happened and so now we're kind of like at least i'm kind of like rooting for the mummy to come back to life so it's like come on mummy like you can work with the cops and bring this guy down and you know it's like i mean i don't think it's going to go that way but you get what i'm saying right like the scene is sort of like like a very like kind of uh well-known scene in a way like um and then we know there's danger and we know this guy's in trouble and then suddenly the danger comes from a totally different place i don't even know what you'd call this like is it just good plotting um but it's i guess it's specifically when i get tricked because i think i know oh it's one of these kind of scenes you know because of conventions and it doesn't have to be a genre story either um but it's just one of these kind of scenes I think I know like through storytelling conventions how it has to go and then it 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 goes in a totally different direction which leads me on to the next technique which I really love um this is like near the tops again this one um tonal variation um especially a kind of tonal variation where things are built up with one uh emotional um kind of like palette and then the resolution to that tension is 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 in a, something totally unexpected um again the person i know who does this best is ovid um in his metamorphoses there's so many examples there's the story of uh, pentheus and he's it's like this uh tension between him and dionysus the god who's come to his city and he's the king and like he's trying to maintain order um and dionysus and his people just want to dance and like um he's like this is a foreign religion and it's all like very political and like kind of like there's these big speeches and you're kind of drawn into the argumentation and the the rhetoric um and then the way that 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 political tension finds its release is through this gothic ritual on a snowy mountain where you know like it's really gory and it's really shocking um but that's where that story finds its resolution unexpectedly um and then another example uh the story of Icarus uh we all know Icarus makes the wings out of wax he goes too close to the sun oh no splash in the water and then his dad Daedalus is like looking out to the sea and feeling really and it's very tragic and he's like my son my boy and it's really sad and then suddenly this partridge uh jumps out of a bush and starts like you know like clucking triumphantly or you know making bird noises in a very like triumphant kind of vaunting way and it's just so ridiculous um and you're like what and it's really funny as well and then um and then the narrator is like let me explain why this partridge was was so happy about what happened to Daedalus and then it turns out that the partridge is a bird which uh like was came into existence because Daedalus murdered his nephew and the nephew uh his body became the partridge and so it's like haha i got you anyway um it's the the idea you know is that something really tragic is happening and really emotional and then it finds this release through laughter um just like in the other one something very like kind of rhetoric and intellectual found its its release through horror and if you know if you can make me laugh and make me cry and make me feel like in love and make me feel like angry and and all these different things all in the same book then you're doing something amazing as far as i'm concerned um demons by dostoevsky also did this to an extent um and and yeah like when when i i find it very rarely but when i find it all in one book then i'm very happy and finally uh self contained chapters this one's pretty simple <laughs> it's a, a chapter in a book which feels like it could be a short story it feels like everything works almost like perfectly in it and if you took it out of the book it would still be a great 
reading experience. I found this to be true for normal people by Sally Rooney, like a lot of the chapters, because they take place at different points um, in time. Often there's like a few months between different chapters. Um, so that because of those gaps, there's like a little closed story for each chapter, and I really like that. Um, I remember when I read The Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami, I found out that he had, um, I found in a different book, the first chapter of The Wind Up Bird Chronicle, uh, and that chapter had was originally a short story, right, which he then expanded into a whole novel. But it was really fascinating seeing the small changes, really minute details that he'd made um, between his short story version of the first chapter and then the actual first chapter. So he just did little things which, you know, suggested that there was more to come in the in the in the novel version but for people who read Har Haruki Murakami like you'll know that they're often that feeling of incompleteness is part of his style right so um like there wasn't there really weren't that many changes between them but anyway yeah that was just a really interesting experience for me because I saw that even when a writer has this example of a short story which works as a chapter in a novel, they still might want to do little like tweaks just to make it more short storyish or more novelistic. And, and yeah, that was just um, something I found very interesting. But yeah, in general, the point is uh, books where the, the chapters work uh, as standalones or very close to standalones. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a few other things I guess I could add, but like, as you can see, I'm struggling with a lot of these to just like, you know, narrow them down to a specific, like, need to give them a label, you know, uh, rather than just say it's good writing. So, um, so yeah, like I, I'm going to stop there and let me know in the comments, uh, if you like any of these, or if you have your own writing techniques, which you've noticed, which you really love. But yeah, I'm gonna go have lunch now. So bye.